Is this 151? This is 153. What's 151? Do you know the name of the place? I'm a little bit turned around. Thanks. It's a warm, sunny day in Augusta, Georgia, and I'm trying to find the small brick building that Galen Tootle, a disability rights advocate, works out of. I am lost. Totally lost. <clears throat> Hello. I'm trying to figure out, uh, yeah, I turned it where it said 147, 149. W which one are you? Then I see him. Oh, there you go, there you go, hi. He's standing outside smoking a cigarette. Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. You too. And feeling guilty about it. Not good for you. I know it. I'm 61 years old, young lady, I know it. I've been out here a long time. I actually, I quit last year. Mm -hmm. No, two years ago, I quit for an entire year. And my brother. Galen is an employment advocate at Walton Options a nonprofit which serves residents with disabilities across the state. He's also the first vice president for the National Federation of the Blind of Georgia. But I'm here because of his tireless work in the fight against voter suppression in the state on behalf of people with disabilities. He does that work with Rev Up Georgia, which stands for Register, Educate, Vote, Use Your Power. Galen is broad-chested. He's a former amateur wrestler. He wears tinted glasses and a Juneteenth t-shirt in the colors of Black Liberation. Black, yellow, red, and green. You wouldn't know he is blind until you look into his eyes, which don't seem to focus. Uh, I'm legally <laughs> blind, but I, I can see. You can see some? So, okay. Mm, yeah. Galen sucks hard on his cigarette. He says the stress of the new voter suppression laws has him smoking a lot, again. The, the evilness of it all, uh, who sits around and thinks about whether or not a person can get a snack or a drink of water? This is season three of Sounds Like Hate, a podcast series from the Southern Poverty Law Center. I'm Jamila Paxima, and I'm delighted to introduce our new co-host, Yvonne Laddie. I'm thrilled to join the production team. This season, we are examining the rights and lives of individuals who too often have difficulty being accepted for who they are. People who still, despite decades of civil rights battles and triumphs, are forced to continue to demand equal rights and protections promised to all Americans. In this season, we travel to Arizona, Florida, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. We will meet folks who say modern day laws and policies continue to hold them down from living a life of full potential. For some people, discrimination and hate is experienced in overt actions. Other times, oppression is subversive and destructive. These are the stories we've been investigating. Collateral Damage is a two-part episode about the deliberate and calculated way the votes of marginalized groups are being suppressed and how communities are fighting for each other's rights. Voter suppression bills are sweeping the country. In part one, we visit Georgia. Their voting election law is called SB202 or the Election Integrity Act of 2021, and it's 98 pages of restrictions that make voting much, much harder. Since Georgia flipped blue in the 2020 election, state Republican legislators have been determined to, quote, fix the process. They claim these laws are necessary to restore confidence in elections. And after the November election last year, I knew, like so many of you, that significant reforms to our state elections were needed. There is no doubt there were many alarming issues with how the election was handled. And those That's Governor Brian Kemp announcing SB 202. And this is just some of what Georgia residents will face as they try to cast their vote in the upcoming election. There will be less time to request absentee ballots, and there are new strict ID requirements 
for voting with absentee ballots. It's also now illegal to mail absentee ballots for all voters. In Georgia, drop boxes will barely exist. In 2020, drop box voting was high in Democratic counties in Metro Atlanta. About 56% of those voters use this method to vote. If you were in Richmond Hill today, it might have been hard to miss this big purple RV with writing all over it. That's because the Georgia- During the last election, two RVs drove around the state and served as mobile voting sites. Well, that's no longer legal. It's now a misdemeanor to offer food or water to folks waiting online. But Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger saw no evidence of widespread fraud. The audit which is routine in close elections, found no fraud. And Galen believes the bill is designed to sabotage his community's right to vote. These laws are mean-spirited. These laws are designed to marginalize or disenfranchise a certain uh, portion of the population, i.e. black, brown, poor folk. That's us in the disability community. A lot of us are black, a lot of us are brown, a lot of us are poor. And there's more. Georgia's Republican-controlled legislature has more control over the state election board. The Secretary of State is no longer a member of the election board. This bill is literally a laundry list of every grievance former President Donald Trump had with the last election. It's a virtual salute to the former commander-in-chief, whose mission since leaving office is proving his election loss was due to election fraud. But there is no evidence of this. Trump and his allies filed 63 lawsuits in state and federal court. His only victory was in Pennsylvania, when a judge ruled to give voters three more days after the election to provide proper ID and check their ballots. In that spirit, we in the disabled community, we have been impacted by this as well. I like to use the term collateral damage. That loss puts in peril the voting rights of so many people across the country. And here in Georgia, they're mobilizing. There are seven lawsuits in the fight against SB 202. And almost all of them say many of these changes disproportionately negatively affect non-white voters. This is Nancy Abudu. We are arguing that this law is racially discriminatory because it targets and was enacted specifically to target voters of color as well as those with disabilities. We're arguing that the law will result in harming those particular communities when it comes to exercising their right to vote, and that the government has not established any compelling or legitimate reason for why these onerous requirements are necessary in order to protect or safeguard Georgia's election process. Babudu is the Interim Strategic Litigation Director for the Southern Poverty Law Center, who is leading a lawsuit against Georgia on behalf of a host of civil rights organizations. And what is the next step for you and and for Georgians? So our hope is that we will at least get some kind of preliminary relief so that voters will be able to engage in upcoming elections without these kinds of restrictions. And we are just continuing to engage in education so people understand what the current law is and assuming that these laws are on the books as elections come up, that they know what they need to do in order to not be harmed so much by by some of these restrictions. Where are you? Galen. Galen is deep in this fight, but for now, Inside his office, he is finishing off some emails before quitting time. His computer has a 27-inch screen and a keyboard with large keys. He presses his face against the screen, strikes a key, and emails are read to him at a super fast speed. The audio manager, message list, message list, reading page, complimentary region, content page, make them log on. 
That, that's reading awfully fast. <laughs> but that's because I'm trained to listen. But that's how uh, our screen readers work. A screen reader allows people who are blind or visually impaired the ability to use a computer. It reads the words on the computer screen to the user. A lot of uh, accessible equipment, uh, which in turn would allow us to actively apply for jobs, requires money. And uh, in most cases, uh, we can't afford it. Most of us are on fixed incomes or whatever. And uh, this is one of the reasons why a lot of our people aren't employed. Statistics show that the total number of Georgia residents with disabilities is over 2.1 million, making up about 28% or one in four Georgians. And they have a lot at stake. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, only 36.3% of them had a job. The state has 650,000 eligible voters with disabilities. 74% of these voters used mail-in ballots or early in-person voting. Nationally, in 2020, more people with disabilities voted than ever, topping 17.7 million, an increase of 6%. All the new options to vote inspired advocates and people living with disabilities. We had no money, no money at all. Zan Thornton is the co-director of Georgia Adapt. But we just got people to come bring their vans, come pick up people. And so we ended up with 500 rides. Wow. It was just amazing. I, I couldn't, I still can't believe it. Georgia Adapt is one of the nonprofits who have joined the lawsuit, 6th District of the African Methodist Episcopal Church versus Kemp, on behalf of voters with disabilities. The lawsuit was filed by the Southern Poverty Law Center and joined by the ACLU of Georgia and a host of other organizations. Zan says the effort to ensure basic voting rights for people with disabilities will be an uphill battle. I feel my responsibility is to help people vote, and it's going to be five times harder. It's going to be five times more expensive. It's going to be a challenge. Zan is a veteran with disabilities. They use a wheelchair, have hearing loss, PTSD, spinal cord injuries, chronic fatigue, ADHD, and dyslexia. A social worker during the last election, they made it their mission to get hundreds of voters with disabilities to the polls. They called their friends from around the country who had vans and asked them to drive to Georgia to help. They say even before the voter suppression law, it was tough for these voters. From my experience and what I've experienced with other people, it's you have to wait in line. They make it unnecessarily long waits. And in the last presidential election, despite all their efforts for others, Zan didn't vote. I felt bad on the day to vote. I kept postponing going to vote. I couldn't get up and do it because I knew I'd wait tw probably twice as long. Um, even though I'm in my wheelchair, even though I can bring a lot of water and it's just, usually I lay down every hour or so. Um, so all the waiting is just exhausting for me. And COVID was happening, and I don't think we had the shots by then. And so it just felt overwhelming. So I did not vote in the election. I did vote in the runoff. That's the first time I've missed an election in ages. I felt so disempowered that I felt so lousy, I couldn't even go vote. Despite early voting and absentee ballots, voters in Georgia stood in line for hours. Here's Mark Hill, a 65-year-old Savannah voter. Um, we arrived at 6.15. Now, the polls don't open up till 7. By the time we got there, that line was already wrapped around the building. And we waited in line until 2. I think we cast our votes at 2.20. Yeah, just about 8 hours, yeah. Mark decided to make the eight-hour wait festive for himself and fellow voters. You get three gay guys in a line, and we were playing disco music and dancing the whole time. It was 70s disco, the good stuff, not the bad John Travolta stuff. Another Georgia voter who didn't want to give her name says she waited three hours to vote. We did early voting, and... Um... We got there in like an hour early. 
Then by the time I left, the lines were wrapped around the building. I even had a chair. (laughs) But the voters who spent hours exercising their right were not going to be deterred. You can tell there was something different this time. (laughs) People were really like, we're we're out here to vote. I don't care what's going to happen. I would do it again in a heartbeat. There's no question in my mind that I would stand in line and do that again. 2021 marks the 56th anniversary of the Landmark Voting Rights Act, which prohibits racial discrimination in voting. It was President Lyndon Baines Johnson's signature achievement. Finally, give Black people truly the right to vote after so many states through obstacle after obstacle to stop the Black vote. President Johnson addressed Congress in 1965. Every device of which human ingenuity is capable has been used to deny this right. The Negro citizen may go to register only to be told that the day is wrong, or the hour is late, or the official in charge is absent. And if he persists, and if he manages to present himself to the registrar, He may be disqualified because he did not spell out his middle name or because he abbreviated a word on the application. And if he manages to fill out an application, he is given a test. The registrar is the sole judge of whether he passes this test. He may be asked to recite the entire Constitution or explain the most complex provisions of state law. Now, with small cuts and slashes, the rights of some Americans to vote are still being denied. Nancy Abudu, the SPLC attorney, calls these attacks on voting rights racism. It is what racism looks like today. It is how it operates in our current system where we don't have the same widespread kind of violence against communities in the South, but we have violence happening in a different way in terms of voter suppression. And just as they updated their racist tactics, we have to update our strategies in terms of how we address it. Mark Updegrove, the president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation in Texas, agrees voting rights are not guaranteed for everyone. Well, it's clearly racially driven. But of, of, of that myriad of transformational laws, the one he was most proud of was the Voting Rights Act. Because he felt that if people of color in this nation, if, if everybody had equal access to the ballot box, we would have truly representative government, which is really what we're all about. He says Johnson believed access to voting was the heart of civil rights. And with the power of the vote in every American's pocket, civil rights laws would not even be needed. You wouldn't need things to protect people who were vulnerable and discriminated against because they would have representatives who were seen to their interests. So I think that there's no question that uh, of the critics of those who are dismantling the, the, the voting laws that we have in this country, LBJ, were he alive today, would be the most vocal. Are you enjoying this programming? You can support this project right now, along with all the important efforts of the Southern Poverty Law Center, a nonprofit organization that works to dismantle white nationalism and bolster our inclusive democracy. Simply visit www.splcenter.org and click the donate button. There, you'll find all the quick and easy ways to support the production of this content and join in the SPLC's movement for a more just and equitable society. My name is Lee Jones. I am the CEO and founder of Inspire Positivity. I'm a disability rights advocate in LaGrange, Georgia. Lee is also a grassroots connector. We did um, 
door to door canvassing. We did. Which means she works with ARC Georgia and advocates for people with disabilities in rural communities. Um, we did like a parade with a loudspeaker. She helps educate them on their voting rights and gets them to the polls. We hosted events. Every opportunity that we had to do a voter registration or education, we did it. We did social media campaigns. We pushed really hard. We sent information to the churches. Um, We got with our local community partners and social service agencies. We asked them to give us referrals of disabled people that they may have known about that had never voted or wanted to vote but didn't have a way to get to the polls or if they just didn't know anything about their disability voting rights. Um, we really pushed very hard to, to get that information out. She did all of this while battling her own health and disability issues. I have acute Crohn's disease and autoimmune hepatitis. I'm also battling liver cancer. Um, I um, survived kidney cancer. I have one kidney. And as a result of all those different things going on, um, I'm, I have bipolar syndrome, axis four. But I never really looked at those challenges. Those are just indicative of me, and I've lived with it, you know, for a good majority of my adulthood. Once she became a grassroots connector, she says she got a better understanding of her own voting challenges. You know, my reason for doing an absentee ballot, I cannot stand in a line for hours without sitting down. I have chronic pain for my conditions. That would prevent me from standing in line for hours on end. Um, I do have to have some kind of hydration because of the medication that I take. I get dry mouth a lot. And just mentally, And emotionally, standing in in a line for hours, being in pain, being thirsty. Knowing what it's like to live with a disability sparks Lee's desire to do more. I really had to sit down one day um, and think about what does being a grassroots connector mean to me personally. And I realized I found my tribe. I'm a disabled person, but disabilities can be invisible to others. You could look at an individual such as myself that has a lot going on and they look perfectly healthy to you, but they're not. They're struggling. They're battling. Lee has lived in LaGrange, Georgia for the past five years. She was born in Florida and grew up in Hawaii, but her husband's job led him to this small city, just about an hour from Atlanta. LaGrange is a, a, a wonderful place to raise a family. It's very well connected and tight-knit when it comes to community partners and um, just the people in general. You can get anywhere in five minutes. Everywhere you go, you see someone that you know or have met or worked with or advocated with. Um, People, for the most part, are very friendly. But there's a dark history here. LaGrange is segregated, divided by color. Blacks on one side, whites on the other. And although they mix in the quaint downtown, the divide is clear. We have one African-American on the county commission, and our mayor is white, our police chief is white, our sheriff is white, our fire chiefs are white. And here is how the legacy of slavery in America dictates how a town is run. Slavery mentality is deeply entrenched here, especially in South Georgia. And the reason for that is because about an hour down the interstate in Montgomery, Alabama, that was the financial center for slavery. Every slave that came into the state of Georgia at some point made it to that financial center to be sold off to go in different directions across the nation. A lot of the lynchings that went on in the nation happened here in Georgia. It's just how it is. Do you feel like things are are going backwards? I mean, it seems like a lot of these laws remind me of things we were seeing, you know, 60 years ago. I think they're going backwards. Those mentalities have been suppressed for years because of the federal and state laws that have been implemented to prevent it. But 
She says Trump's election in 2016 emboldened people to speak openly about the hate they once shared in private conversations. He opened up that Pandora's box and a lot was revealed. Even here in this small town, it was very, very, very bad during the general election um, about how people felt about racial and social injustices. And it was sad to see because many of the colleagues that I have been working with for the last five years that I thought were progressive people turned out to not be. What, what were they saying? <sighs> what, did, what did they reveal? They revealed who they really were, that they really don't care about equality. Disability knows no gender or race, and lawmakers may have overlooked the toll these laws would take on their own people. She says the fear is driven by wanting to slow down the vote in majority-minority counties. It's not only Black people that's going to be affected. So why would you create a voter bill that's going to impact your people as well? They didn't think that through. They did not look at the big picture. They were reacting to loss. They were reacting to losing their foothold for the first time in decades. Governor Kemp signed the bill into law surrounded by white men, with a painting of a plantation behind him. That was a powerful image, and that really angered a lot of people. What did that image say to you? (laughs) That they're going to try to go back to the status quo. They want to get their glory back, and they're going to try to stop us with any means necessary and that they're thinking that the old guard the old way that they used to do things was going to frighten people um, into kowtowing to that foolishness but it had the opposite effect exact opposite effect why do you think Georgia turned blue it sent two democratic senators to um, the capitol No one wants to revisit anything that gives any semblance to the Holocaust. No one wants to be oppressed in any way, shape, form, or fashion. No one wants that anymore. And it's not necessarily being oppressed by Caucasians, just oppression, period. No one wants to be disenfranchised. And is that what it felt like these last four years? Oppression? Oh, it gave me great anxiety. I was extremely, extremely worried about Trump getting a second term and what that could have meant because of his rhetoric, because of his hate-filled speeches, because of the ugliness that he brought out in Caucasian people. And even in some some of our Black people were following him as well. Lee wants to show me LaGrange, a town of about 30,000 people. So we get into her car and first drive through White LaGrange. So right now we're in District 2, which is the predominantly white side of town. As we drive, the landscape is country clubs, golf courses, lush greenery, a lovely lake, old plantation homes, mini mansions. Everything's well scrubbed, picture perfect. No black residents or black faces in this part of LaGrange. LaGrange has a lot of wealth, and a lot of that wealth is generational wealth that has been passed down. Then we cross the train tracks, and we are on Whitesville Road, which isn't white. It's the black part of town. Here, the average income is $20,000 a year. 28% of the residents of LaGrange live in poverty, which is higher than the national average of 13.1. Oh my God, look, they're like broken down. Oh my God. Do you see the difference? Oh my God. It's like, a, it's like an overwhelming difference. Faded paint, 
Dilapidated, rundown homes welcome you to this part of town. There's a lot of public housing in the familiar dull brick facade, but the housing authority is working on renovations. You don't really see new construction in LaGrange. The new construction that you see will be in a little enclave that I told you about, but you can't see it. And you don't know that it's happening. And it's really pretty much out of most people's um, price range. What kind of work do the black people here do? They're just sort of service workers, minimum wage? Service workers, minimum wage, and production workers. Like for um, carpet manufacturers, auto parts supplier, the Kia Motors. This town is an industrial town. It's a lot of production work. There is no public transportation in LaGrange. There are no wheelchair accessible walkways. In fact, not a lot of sidewalks in some parts. There is little affordable housing. So the poor black people in District 1 are in a perpetual struggle with little political leadership to help. These homes, some of these homes are so far gone that there's nothing that you can do for them. The houses need to be just knocked down. One of the things that we really have to work on is our people and encouraging them to look outside of the box and wanting more for themselves. So a lot of people just don't, they just live just like this. Advocates like Lee say, in a town like LaGrange, where the many black residents work low-income jobs, the Election Integrity Act strikes at their very right to vote. And if you're living with a disability, getting around is not something you can take for granted. All the social ills that affect how people live have a hand in access to voting. Practical hurdles, ID, difficulty registering, or finding the right polling location are very real concerns. In Georgia, where voters of color experience longer wait times at the polls, the voter suppression bill includes a provision that makes it more difficult for a judge to expand polling place hours. Local political representation in LaGrange is Republican, despite having slightly more minority residents. Trump won 60% of the county vote. This is what we call the long white king. This is a trademark of the National Federation of the Blind. We believe in the long white king. It allows us to travel faster and uh, more safely. Okay. Galen needs a ride to the barber shop where he's gonna get spruced up for his upcoming community meeting with Vice President Kamala Harris, who has been tapped by the White House to lead the fight against voter suppression. Galen has lived in Georgia all his life. See, I go back a long way. I can remember uh, separate waiting rooms, uh, having to go get a fish sandwich from my uh, aunt who worked at the uh, local juke joint, and she was the cook there. But in order for me to come and get something, I would have to go to the back. So you grew up in the South? Yes. You from, you from, where are you from? I'm there? from a town called Glenville, Georgia, which is in Southeast Georgia. It's a small rural town. And uh, due to my advocacy work, uh, it, it became uh, in, in, incumbent upon me to leave. One guy told me, for instance, don't you know your wife? rides up and down the streets in this town at night. So long as you stay in your place, boy, you were all right. He says Jim Crow never really ended in the South. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I call it James Crow Esquire because it's Jim Crow all grown up. But what they do is the same stuff. When we look at the nature of these bills, particularly SB 202, we have to understand that this is not new. It is a type of mentality that we're up against. Galen was one of six children, and he and his brother are blind. It's genetic, congenital cataracts. His family was poor but proud, hardworking, and lived through big moments in the civil rights movement and beyond. We saw integration come. Uh, we saw the separate but equal stuff go away. And uh, then I saw Barack Obama. 
and uh, I really thought this work was really over with. Uh, and then yet here we are. I think uh, in, in hindsight, in retrospect, Barack triggered a lot of this, not through no fault of his, but simply because through the, uh, the fear and the, uh, all of the other things that, that are tied in with, uh, with, with the white man. If you're enjoying this programming, consider a gift of support to the Southern Poverty Law Center, the nonprofit organization behind the Sounds Like Hate podcast. Now, in its 50th year of fighting hate and bigotry, the SPLC works in partnership with communities to end white supremacy by serving as a catalyst for racial justice in the South and beyond. Visit www.sblcenter.org today and click the donate button to discover ways to support this and all its important work for justice and equity. In Georgia, Republican State Representative Barry Fleming is a big pusher of voter suppression. He leads the Georgia Legislature's Special Committee on Election Integrity. Here he is speaking to a crowd in Arizona captured on hidden video at the annual meeting of the Heritage Action for America, the sister organization of the Heritage Foundation, one of the most influential right-wing public policy think tanks in the country. The April 22, 2021 event was called Restoring Confidence in Our Elections. The leaked recording was released in May by the watchdog group Documented. So I can't right now say thank you enough uh, for the support the Heritage Foundation has given to us. I can tell you back in February, I felt like some days we were alone in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And then the Heritage Foundation stepped in. And that began to bring us a boost to help turn around, get the truth out about what we were really trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm here in part to say thank you and God bless you. And in the very same gathering. Frankly, the problems that we are trying to fix in courageous states like Georgia. So to Jessica God, Anderson is the executive director of Heritage Action for America, a sister organization of the Heritage Fund. She boasted on stage that both organizations were advising and drafting the new changing voter legislation, not only in Georgia, but across the U.S. This is a $24 million investment over the next two years. As we create this echo chamber, we're working with these state legislators to make sure they have all of the information they need to draft the bills. In some cases, we actually draft them for them, or we have a sentinel on our behalf, give them the model legislation so it has that grassroots, you know, from the bottom up uh, type of vibe. We've also hired state lobbyists to make sure that in these targeted states, we're meeting with the right people. I was able to sit down with Governor Kemp three days before he signed the election package in Georgia, and I had one message for him. Do not wait to sign that bill. If you wait even an hour, you will look weak. At the end of the day, the bill that Governor Kemp signed and the Georgia legislature marshaled through had eight key provisions that Heritage recommended. And Galen says he knows this is how these laws were created. We know that a lot of these bills were written by ghostwriters, uh, a bunch of conservative folks sitting in a dark room somewhere, uh, and they came up with all of these different legislations. Because if you look at the laws, Georgia's laws are basically like Texas's laws. Texas's laws are basically like Arizona laws. So in other words, there was some, a group of people sitting down. They did research. Okay, the disabled folk, they tend to vote this way. Black folk, they tend to vote this way. Uh, the poor people tend to vote this way. Uh, and uh, you got folk who do the research and say, well, if you do this, this can cause folk to may decide they don't want to be bothered with voting. Still, it doesn't discourage him from fighting. Even at the barbershop, Galen is advocating. This time, it's getting his community vaccine information. If we, uh, if we let me put a table out here, or, or not a table, but pass out flyers about the vaccination program, because if we can... He says our government is moving towards an authoritarian mindset. Uh, they are getting to the point where it doesn't matter what you want, it's what they want. And it's all about staying in power. 
How extensive is, is the fight to fight these voter suppression laws? It's not as extensive as it should be. And the reason I say that is because every black person, every poor person should be upset. And they're not. But in 1865, at the ending of, uh, of slavery in the United States as a legal institution, the history of It's Juneteenth in LaGrange, and in Calumet Park, the food trucks are ready to serve chicken wings and burgers. Vendors and advocacy group booths line the park. There's a table to educate and register to vote. Politicians make speeches, but the crowd is thin. Buckets of rain are pouring from the sky. Lee Jones and other community leaders are huddled under the awning of a building watching the speakers. Thank you so much for coming out. This Juneteenth celebration, rain or shine, we're out here. It's very important to the, to the city. My name is Kevin Littlefield. I'm the chairman of the Troop County Democratic Party here in Troop County, Georgia. Kevin is eating what looks like a cheese sandwich in a boxed lunch. But when I ask him for his thoughts on voter suppression, he puts his sandwich down. You know, I don't think you want to hear a lot of cursing and cussing in your interview, do you? But it's flat out Jim Crow part two. It's straight up racist. Brian Kemp, he gets up there. God, you got me on one of my issues here. But he gets up there and he cherry picks the parts of the bill that he thinks will, you know, mollify people or he thinks that will appeal to certain people. SB 202 also secures all ballot drop boxes around the clock, speeds up processing to ensure quicker election results, requires security paper to allow for authentication of ballots, and allows the bipartisan state election board to have more oversight over counties who fail to follow state election law. Oh, God, it, it's, it just makes my blood boil. And, and the way they package it, they, they want to talk about, you know, and first off, you know, voter IDs is not a slam dunk issue. Twenty five percent of the black community in America does not have a photo ID. And it costs up to two or three hundred dollars to get one. That, that's what he wants to put out there. But that's not the meat of this bill. The meat of this bill is, is to enable the Republican led legislature to be able to affect the vote totals in the big counties that are predominantly black, like Fulton or DeKalb. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but that's, that's one of my issues. It gets me going, so. I mean, what can be done to, to stop it? Outvote them. That's, that's what we've been saying for years and years and years now. We, we, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a tall order because the districts in the state are so gerrymandered. You know, I mean, Georgia is going to be one of those minority majority states and and i'm not just talking about the black community there's all sorts of different ethnic groups in georgia but they're going to outnumber the white population here in georgia very soon kevin says we need a new federal voter rights bill because it's not just georgia every republican controlled state is eyeing voter suppression bills or has enacted them According to the Brennan Center, so far, 19 states have enacted 33 laws that restrict access to voting. Nearly 1,000 voter restriction bills have been introduced in 49 states and are moving through the legislature. And it's, it's straight up white supremacy and racism. You know, if you can't see me, I, you know, I'm, I'm as white as they come, but you know, the, the, the wealth gap, the inequality in voting and stuff, it does not benefit the white people in the state either. Well, maybe, you know, some of the extremely rich ones, but black poverty's not helping me. Regardless of what Brian Kemp says, this voting bill in Georgia is racism. But Kemp claims it's not. According to them, if you support voter ID for absentee ballots, you're a racist. According to them, if you believe in protecting the security and sanctity of the ballot box, you are, quote, Jim Crow in a suit and tie, end quote. Walk with me, Lord, walk with me. Walk with me, Lord, walk with me, 
while I'm on this tedious journey, I want you, Lord, to walk with me. If you try to put uh, barriers out there that tells me that uh, I'm less than what you are or who you are, then I get angry about that. Like I have children. I have a son. I have grandchildren. And I want them to live in a better world than I have. My daddy was doing this same fight back in the 60s, and that's amazing to me. We've had a black president, and yet and still we are back here doing this same stuff. We want to choose who lead us. And if we can't vote, then we won't have the ability to do that. Galen says the path to victory depends on like-minded people and groups working together. With the wave of the white nationalism and all that stuff that's sweeping this country, chances are it is going to come to a city near you. So we need for us to get together, become one community, and fight against voter suppression. This is not a political issue. Everybody should be able to have a right to vote. This shouldn't be about... Disabled folk, black folk, poor folk, uh, white folk. It should be about all folk having the ability to vote. A few more snips, a thin mustache trim, and the haircut is over. And guess what? With my barber, I don't even have to look in the mirror. You know why? Because he's going to make sure I'm straight. A few days later, I give Galen a call to see how his meeting with the vice president went. I bet, I bet you look good with your new haircut. You didn't see the pictures. I ain't seen you. didn't get no pictures, did you? You should send me one. Did you have one of you and her together or something like that? I have a lot to send it to you right now. Yes, yeah. please do. That, that would be fun. But I wanted to follow up on so how did the meeting go with Kamala Harris? It was a great meeting. Uh, it was an intimate uh, meeting. It was not a photo op. There were no journalists or camera folk in the room. Uh, it was real. It was sincere. And I spoke to uh, Title II of the uh, American with Disabilities Act. But if there was one Title II of, of the ADA prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all programs, activities, and services of public entities. What we need is the DOJ to come down and enforce it. We already got the laws on the books, but we need it enforced. Because here in Georgia, the blind vote is totally disenfranchised. And ADA, Title II, would go a long way towards fixing that because if the feds did their job of enforcing the ADA, then they wouldn't be able to lock us out of the system as they have. He says they need better messaging. So when you speak about voter suppression, make sure you mention my people. And not as an afterthought, not as the last one on the list, but as people who are uh, certainly getting impacted by these uh, Jim Crow voter suppression laws. But at the meeting, Senator John Ossoff told him stopping the wave of voter suppression won't be an easy fix. You know, we got to be realistic in our approach. Despite everything that we do, it's a 50-50 split. Uh, so, uh, the split made it impossible for the Senate to agree on any sweeping voter protection law, including the John Lewis Act, named after the late congressman and civil rights icon John Lewis. The proposed legislation would have strengthened the voting rights of people of color and people living with disabilities. And so, where do things stand now? Well, Senate Democrats are still pushing to strengthen the Voting Rights Act. And Attorney General Merrick Garland is leading the Justice Department in a lawsuit against Georgia. There are many things that are open to debate in America. But the right of all eligible citizens to vote is not one of them. The right to vote is the cornerstone of our democracy, the right from which all other rights ultimately flow. The grounds? Georgia is discriminating against black voters. Here is Attorney General Garland again. In keeping that promise, today the Department of Justice is suing the state of Georgia. Our complaint alleges that recent changes to Georgia's election laws were enacted with the purpose of denying or abridging the right of black Georgians to vote on account of their race or color in violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. 
Kemp and the Republicans are ready to fight it. Let me be clear. The DOJ lawsuit announced today is legally and constitutionally dead wrong. Their false and baseless accusations are quite honestly disgusting. But I will tell you right now, we are not backing down. I am not backing down. And I can tell you that Joe Biden, Stacey Abrams, and Merrick Garland don't scare me. And Galen's ready for the fight. Do you think you're going to win? Absolutely. I always win. Now, sometimes it takes a long time. Disability rights or civil rights, which means that we're lining up with uh, most of America. We can't help but win. On the next episode of Sounds Like Hate, part two of collateral damage. In Florida, the formerly incarcerated had their right to vote yanked away by Republican legislatures. You know, you got a million people that can't vote? That's a problem. We should not be denied our right to vote. You cannot disenfranchise us from voting for the President of the United States and our federal Congress. It was like, oh, this is a black thing, this and that. No, it, it affects more people who are white. These are complicated stories about people who fight for their truth. Those who are demanding affirming policies, which will not rob people of their power, nor strip any American of having equal access, influence, protections, and voting rights. If you know someone who has experienced a hate incident or crime, please contact the appropriate local authorities or elected officials. You can also document what happened at splcenter.org. This is Sounds Like Hate, an independent audio documentary brought to you by the Southern Poverty Law Center, produced by Until 20 Productions. I'm Jamila Paxima. And I'm Yvonne Laddie. Remember to subscribe to find out when new episodes are released. Please rate and review. It really helps. And thanks for listening. Thank you.